All right, so today I'm going to talk to you about equity-driven design of novel sensing systems for health. Um, so again, my name is Alex Adams. I'm a research scientist at Cornell Tech in New York City. Um, I work for the Precision Behavioral Health Initiative. All right. All right, so I'm going to do this talk in a slightly different order, kind of a weird order. Uh, first, I'm going to motivate the problem and talk about the prevalence. Then I'm going to talk about a project uh, called OptoBeat, where we demonstrate equity-driven design principles. After that, I'm going to jump into the guidelines and the considerations that go behind this design principles. Um, and then I'm going to go back to another project to talk about it more. The reason I'm doing this is for time's sake, because this is taken from a much longer talk. All right, so first things first, I want to kind of define some of the uh, def the words and phrases I'm going to use throughout this talk. Uh, the first is determinants of health. So determinants of health are the conditions that surround a person, where they live, work, grow, their age, their income. So this is at a personal level. Then we have health inequities. This is more of a systematic level. This is unfair differences in health status between populations. Then we have the ending result of health disparity, or sorry, of health inequities and determinants of health, which is health disparities. Uh, these are negative gaps in health segments of the population that are avoidable, unnecessary, and unjust. And these are mostly based on the determinants of health. So just to give you an idea of how big of a problem this is, uh, so if you look at some chronic diseases here, so pediatric asthma that's, uh, affects 7.7% of white American children, while it affects 12.6% of black American children. Diabetes is 13% white Americans and three times that high for Native Americans, 39%, 21.5 for Latinx and 19% for Asian Americans. And hypertension is almost twice as high in black Americans as it is white Americans. It doesn't just affect chronic health, though. This uh, other things like insurance, uh, you'll see that only 5.9% of white Americans are uninsured, while 16% of Latinx are uninsured, 14% Native Americans. Uh, this also goes to how well people actually feel um, their reported uh, self-report on how they feel. Uh, it's 8.3% uh, feel poor health in white Americans compared to 17% in Native Americans and so on. Uh, then there's treatment, mental health treatment in particular. Uh, so 18.6% of white adults get mental health treatment, while only 14% of Native Americans and 10% of Native Hawaiians do. So technology is not the be-all, end-all solution to this. Um, so technology can also add to this problem. It can be not sensitive to different skin tones, uh, like the pulse oximeter, which has recently had a FDA warning put out against it for not working on people with darker skin tones. It could be not sensitive to different body types. So if you all know the BMI sensors you buy at the store that tell you your body fat index, uh, those actually don't work on obese people. They're made for normal body mass indexes. Uh, it can also not be uh, sensitive to gender or sex. It can add to existing stigmas in the case of substance use disorder uh, or mental health specifically. And it can be too expensive for a lot of people. And the price is probably the biggest inequity of all. So equity-driven design is uh, can enable equitable solutions. Uh, so basically, what is equity-driven de design? It's a collaboration between scientists and domain experts in which you consider the determinants of a sp and the specific needs of a population it's intended for. It's intended to address both existing inequities and fill gaps in healthcare uh, through filling gaps in technology. And it covers both mental and physical health. So a good way to approach an equitable design uh, kind of scenario is to look at it through an ecological model. And this is Ron van Brenner's ecological model. And what you'll see is that we actually start with the person in the center here when we're looking at the problem and all the different uh, determinants of that person. Then we go to the microsystem where we look at where they live, uh, the, where their housing situation is, their families, their therapists, their employers. That sits inside of a meso system, which is the interaction between systems. Uh, going further out, we go to the exosystem where we look at more of the community, social services, societies like uh, AA or NA and the neighborhood they live in. Furthermore, you're looking at the laws and attitudes of society and the economy, how the economy is at the time, culture and ideologies. And this all sits inside of time uh, where all these life changes happens, which we know affects health in so many ways. 
So I'm going to talk about two uh, projects, specifically uh, OptoBeat, which is a solution for pulse oximetry. It's a skin tone calibrated ultra low cost pulse oximeter. And I'm going to talk about Puff Packet, which is a discrete and automatic uh, device for monitoring e-cigarette use. So as I mentioned, pulse oximetry fails in people with darker skin tones. This has been going on for about 20 years, um, and unfortunately, it wasn't brought to light until the recent pandemic, uh, in which respiratory illness uh, became so pervasive. So why did it fail? Well, so let's talk about how a traditional pulse oximeter works. It shines a couple of different wavelengths through the finger. Those wavelengths are compared using Bureau Lambert's Law, and that gives you a ratio of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, but what you can see here is that while they require this inverse uh, relationship of absorption to oxygenation, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, underneath all that is melanin, which is the molecules that change our skin tone. And that is not linear. It's not even, it's not consistent. So how could we have a consistent measurement if we don't know that skin tone? So we started thinking about solutions. First thing we were thinking about is how to make this uh, pulse oximetry even more pervasive, more accessible. So what we thought we had a little computer with some lights and a camera on it in our pockets. And so if you look here, you can see the spectrum of the phone screen. And we can see that we have this inverse relationship with uh, blue and red for oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So this led us to build OptiBeat which is, as I mentioned, an ultra low cost smart tone, a smartphone based pulse oximeter with skin tone calibration. So how does it work? So basically we have an app, it shoots light through a little clip into a, a plastic lens. It goes through some fiber optic cable into your ear and out your ear, into another lens, into the camera. So why does that work? It works because we can change the color of the screen to alternating colors and the ear which has lots of capillaries in it uh, which is uh, ex in inclusive criteria for measuring a pulse oximetry uh, and a shorter optical distance than the finger which is what you're probably most familiar with seeing so then we get that back into the camera and we get basically a ratio of absorption so our hypotheses were that we can also classify skin tone with a smartphone camera, and this can be leveraged to calibrate pulse oximetry and then show that our pulse oximetry measurements are reliable down to even unhealthy levels as low as 70%. And this is a crucial criteria because other smartphone solutions have failed in unhealthy patients even below 95%, which really makes them not useful at all. So for skin tone calibration, what we did is we got some synthetic skin, uh, some phantom skin that was made out of proteins and fibers and three different skin tones. And we printed out a skin tone color strip. And by taking an image of those two beside each other, we actually have a light calibrated uh, ground truth. So we were able to classify skin tone actually quite easily. Uh, and the results were uh, so basically right here, what we did is we actually tested the, uh, pulse oximetry measurements in each skin tone. And these proved our point, our hypothesis too, that, uh, the pulse oximeters do not measure correctly in, uh, different skin tones. And here you can see, uh, with OptoBeat and with the ground truth, uh, gold standard pulse oximeter, that the skin tones did have a huge change in between types of skin tones. All right, so we've done that. Now, how do we test without getting uh, patients involved really unhealthy levels of pulse, of pulse ox, blood oxygen saturation? Well, we reoxygenated sheep's blood and pumped it through a system where we could let the oxygen slowly leak out and measure it over time. And we get this linear decrease in blood oxygen saturation. And it worked really well. Um, so here's what the setup looked like. We have this synthetic artery and synthetic flesh. We did this with the different colors. We had some optodes in there and ground truth, and we pulsed blood through there. Over time, that would decrease. And as you can see, we got this great mapping with the regression. So then we want to show, yes, this also can work on human subjects. All right, so we tested it on ourselves, and we get signal. 
Now, in the future, what we're doing is actually trying to create a more robust in-house testing system uh, so we can really build this out more. Uh, so we're actually now building a sort of DIY ex-corporal oxygenation membrane. Um, so this will allow us to not just wait for oxygen to leave the blood, but to actually control the levels of it automatically. So how is this all equity driven design? All right. So we have the skin tone calibration to account for that. And then we made it ultra cheap, right? So the idea is that this could be uh, cost actually cost less than a dollar for me to make. So at scale would be even cheaper. Um, and it could be pseudo disposable even if you're looking at a very uh, high infection area, such as uh, when there's a pandemic breaks out and people are in a waiting room and they all need to get their pulse oximetry tested. How do we do that? So anyways, so let's go into the design considerations. And this is more uh, general design considerations for uh, equity driven design um, and some of which you just saw in OptoBeat. So the first thing I want to do is talk about sheep. Bah. So the first things we need to do when we're thinking about a problem is we think about bias. Is it going to have any bias to it like a lot of computer vision programs do? Uh, can we make it affordable and make it accessible? So not only can it be affordable, uh, accessible because it's affordable, but accessible regionally, right? So one big problem is uh, location uh, and being able to get to the right services. And we need to think about heterogeneity, like how well is this going to work across different groups? I mean, just because it's made to include a group that was not included before uh, doesn't mean it should only work for them, right? How do we make this work for as many people as possible? Uh, the next uh, design guidelines are called CUPS, which is cost benefit, utility, privacy, and stigma. So cost benefit means that the uh, cost of using it should uh, be outweighed by the benefits it provides. Uh, utility, this, uh, this device needs to have clear benefits over traditional non-technological counterparts. Privacy, this is private data, it's health data, you gotta think about that. And similar to privacy, but very different at the same time is stigma. So it should be discreet for use and not look like a medical device. Uh, this is particularly important, as I mentioned before, uh, with uh, substance use disorder, which is another health disparity. Um, and for things like me other mental illnesses where people aren't comfortable having others know that they uh, have it. So, Several years ago, my colleagues and I uh, published this paper, excuse me, uh, uh, called Mindless Computing. Now, this was about interventions and feedback mechanisms, but these are the modified principles from that that are meant to be focused more on the actual sensing mechanism as opposed to feedback. So the first is reflexive, not reflective. So the input should be mindless. It's got to be easy to use, and I'll show you how we did that in the next project, with Puff Packet. Uh, the they shouldn't have to reflect on their behavior as they do in self-report. They should be able to get that input automatically. Triggers should be the main focus for design of, of designers for technologies. And this can be literal, like in substance use disorder, we can monitor the use and presence of substances or figurative, like people, places, and things that are around someone when they uh, are getting sick or when they are using a substance. And I'll talk a bit more about that in the next project. So this should work in parallel with their other lives, with their daily lives. They should not have to do another task. So most of our technologies right now are what we would call reflective. Um, so you shouldn't have to stop and look at something or, or pick something up and do something else to sense it. It should work while you're doing stuff. And users also can change their behaviors without being aware of it. So asking a user about how they're feeling and stuff like that isn't reliable. Self-report is not reliable. It's particularly bad in substance use disorder because of stigma, denial, and intoxication. We have to leverage technology for new ground truths. All right, so now I'm going to get into more on health disparities. I'm going to do it on time. Uh, substance use disorder. So, even, so this is a huge problem. It affects 1 in 12 people in the U.S. which have or have had substance use disorder. That's over 21.5 million uh, currently battle substance use disorder, and only 10% get treatment. Of that 10%, on average, 50% of them relapse in treatment or recovery. An eighth of them struggle with both alcohol and drug use, and 8 million have comorbid mental health disorders. This led to over 100,000 deaths uh, between April 2020 and 2021. This is 30,000 more than the year prior. Um, I'll let you guess why. 
But just to put this in perspective, at the peak of the AIDS epidemic back in 1995, there were 42,000 deaths, I believe. So this is almost 250% higher. So there's even inequity within substance use disorder uh, by psychiatric disorders. Uh, that's 44% purchase of all cigarettes. Uh, more than half people with substance use disorder and a comorbid mental disorder are men, and over 2 million middle and high school students currently use e-cigarettes, and 85% report using flavored products. So let's look at this ecological model again, but now specifically to substance use disorder. So we can look at this through stigmas and the ideologies. Uh, we can think about the people that are around, who's their sponsor, who's their family. We can look about what's going on in their life. And all these things are important to know because... Uh, Substance use disorder is very cyclic. Uh, you increase use because your tolerance uh, increases and your dependence increases simultaneously. This worsens withdrawal. Your hangovers will get worse until you're actually getting physically very sick. Uh, then this causes an increase in cravings because uh, at this point you're getting to where this is the only thing that makes you feel good, which increases use, increases tolerance, worsens withdrawal, et cetera makes it very difficult. And just to understand a bit about cravings, that these are both uh, physical and mental phenomenon. Uh, that could be unconditioned uh, or conditioned. Unconditioned would be when you have the substance in front of you, and conditioned would be when you, say, walk by a bar. That's one of your favorite places to drink. So to combat some of this uh, problem with this disparity in substance use disorder, we create a puff packet. Um, this is all open source on GitHub. Puff Packet is a device that attaches to electronic cigarettes and monitors use through monitoring the electricity in the devices. So it captures not only puffing, duration, uh, frequency, and then the intervals, but also location and activity. How does it work? It works by, well, two ways. One by monitoring voltage and the other by monitoring current. And basically, if you think about it, these your inhalation is dependent uh, on the voltage heating up, or sorry, the current heating up the heating coil. So these two things, the heating coils, power, and your breathing inhalation are directly correlated. So once that happens, it causes a interrupt and wakes up, sends the all the puffing information over to the smartphone. And this is what it looks like. Here you can see both models. Uh, you see long puff, short puff, short puff, long puff. And to test this, well, of course, we didn't sit around and take hundreds of puffs of e-cigarettes. We made a puffing robot, PuffBot, and proved that works really well with a 50%, uh, 50 millisecond absolute error. And what does all the data look like? It looks really interesting. This allows us to get much more intuition about how people are using e-cigarettes and better equips us to help them stop using it. So there you can see uh, Cornell, Ithaca, where Puff Packet was. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Hall is where the majority of the puffing went. We also did an eight day study with one participant to see them using it. And you can see they mostly used it when they were driving or walking or stationary, not while they're cycling. <clears throat> so you can do a lot of different analyses with this. Uh, you're gonna understand how puffs are distributed throughout the day, throughout the week. Uh, this is a very important metrics and cigarette analysis. And we didn't have such a thing for uh, something that's less discreet as puffing on a, an e-cigarette. So the time to puff is an important metric, for example, if you can uh, first time to first puff, actually. So if you could increase the time for their first puff, then you increase the chances of them not puffing at all. So we've also recreated uh, the puff bot to a quick little puffer just for your quick test. And then for the real big studies, we made Puff Daddy. Puff Daddy likes to chief on cigarettes and monitors volumetric flow and pressure. And the reason we did that is because with diaphragm pumps and Puff Bot, you always get this cyclic noise, where with Puff Daddy, you get much more lung-like behavior. And to conclude, there's a picture of a Lego guy banging on a phone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. This is all such important work, Alex. Thank you so much.